Um, I wanted really to tell you a bit about how I work when I'm actually researching a book as well. And of course, Coco Caramel, it's not just a one-off book, it's book four in a series called The Chocolate Box Girls. It's called The Chocolate Box Girls because the parents in the series um, have this luxury chocolate business, um, which I thought would be fun to write about. And of course, I had done a lot of research into chocolate over the years, so that was something I knew plenty about. Um, but the other thing I like to know, I like to have quite a strong idea of where a story is set. And I thought that the characters might live in quite a romantic countryside place, perhaps by the sea. And it made me imagine, um, or it made me remember, a place that I had worked when I was an art student um, during the summer holidays. So I'd worked in Somerset in a little village that seemed really idyllic and perfect to me. So um, I decided that I would set the story there. And I went back to that place, I did drawings, made notes, took photographs, then I changed the name of the village in the story just so I could alter the details if I felt like it. Um, the stories, or the series, it's really about five sisters in a blended family, so a step family. How they learn to get along together um, about the friends and the boys and all of the ups and downs in their lives. And each of those sisters has a story to tell. So the first book, um, is called Cherry Crush, and Cherry is the sister telling that story. Marshmallow Sky is the second, that comes next. And Sky is the story, and is the sister telling that story. Summer's Dream is the third, and Summer is actually Sky's identical twin. And Coco Caramel is the fourth. She's the youngest sister, and she's 12 when she tells her story. And there is, of course, an older sister, Honey, and she's not quite as sweet as her name would suggest, but hey, her story's coming in June. Now, when I'm um, actually writing about a new character, I like to get into the world of that character and into the mind of that character. And one thing that helps me to do that, I'll make a mood board on, on the pin board next to where I work, um, and I'll stick on photographs, things cut from magazines, drawings I've done, actual objects sometimes, and sometimes written notes. And this, I suppose, is um, a PowerPoint version of the mood board that I have at home. So this is, this is what I was working with as I was writing Coco Caramel. And it gives you clues to Coco's personality, clues to the story. So if we look at this, we can see a girl who looks as though she could be a bit of a tomboy, um, a violin, there's a Save the Whales poster, a panda face cupcake, there's a ruined cottage and an Exmoor pony, and all of those things kind of flag up little bits and pieces to do with Coco's personality and to do with the story. And I know nobody really particularly has noticed the picture of the very cool boy in the right-hand corner there, but funnily enough, there is quite a cool boy in the book as well, so he's there for a reason as well. And although it's nice to have some clues about, visual clues, if you like, about the personality of my main character, it's not really, it doesn't come to life until you hear and see that character in action. So I thought I'd read you a little bit from chapter three so you can actually find out what Coco is like in action. And because it's chapter three, I'd better set the scene. She is indeed crazy about animals and a bit of a tomboy. And um, on the day that I'm going to read you about, Coco has had a big cake sale at her school to raise money for endangered species, and in particular for the panda. And that's what the panda face cupcakes are about, because she makes boxes and boxes of panda face cupcakes to sell, and she raises a bit of money, and all is brilliant, except for a slightly um, sarcastic boy called Laurie, who makes a few mean remarks about the cake sale, but Coco takes no notice. Now, um, just a, a very quick check. Does anybody here have one of those little panda hats that have been quite popular this winter? Anybody got a panda hat here? A couple of people, just a couple of people. Well, um, I knew there would be a couple of cool, cool people with panda hats because Coco actually has a panda hat herself. She wears it to school on the day of the cake sale to publicize that cake sale. Um, so everybody knows, you know, she's raising awareness for the pandas. Um, and everything's fine until the end of the day when it's chucking down with rain, just as it is right now, really. And Coco has to go and get her school bus because she lives way out of town. And when she looks for her hat so as not to get wet, it's not there. 
and she has to hunt all over the school. Finally finds the hat, has been hoisted to the top of the school flagpole. Somebody has played a really nasty practical joke and Coco suspects it could be Laurie Marshall responsible, okay? So she's not impressed. By the time she gets her hat down from the flagpole, she's soaking wet and the school bus has long gone. So she is not in the best of moods and that's the bit that I'm going to read you from today. So this is what happens next. I trudge out of the school gates and turn the corner, my panda hat dripping, and I walk right into a nightmare. Laurie Marshall is in the shady walkway next to the school gym. He is locked in battle with a small, scrawny kid, holding him by the jacket, shaking him, growling something angry right into his face. The kid looks terrified, his eyes wide with fear, and I recognize the year six boy from the cake sale earlier, the one who thought that pandas should branch out a bit and eat Big Macs and chocolate fridge cake instead of bamboo shoots. My heart thuds. I hate bullying of any kind, and this is not name calling or teasing, it's full on aggression. Laurie shoves the little kid up against the gym wall and he wriggles helplessly, trying to get away. Let him go, I scream, and two pairs of startled eyes swivel to look at me. Push off, panda girl, Laurie snarls. This is none of your business. That does it. I think of my hat fluttering from the flagpole, a dozen nasty, snide remarks Laurie Marshall has made in the years since he joined our school. I look at the year six kid squirming as he struggles and I see red. I fling myself at Laurie Marshall, grabbing his arms, pulling him backwards away from the boy. His victim slithers free, grabs his abandoned sports bag and sprints off along the walkway. And Laurie Marshall turns on me, his face dark with fury. You idiot, he yells. Now look what you've done. Idiot? Me? I yell back. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're loads bigger than that little kid and old enough to know better. Bullying sucks. Laurie Marshall looks disgusted. His lip curls, his eyes flash, and his fists are clenched and trembling as if fighting the urge to lash out at me. Suddenly, I'm scared, aware that I've just broken up a fight, yelled at a bully, shouted insults at the school misfit. Here I am on a shady walkway, tucked away from the road with a psychopathic schoolboy, and trust me, he is not happy. Idiot, he says again his voice thick with scorn. You really think you're something, don't you? You reckon you can save the world, rescue the panda and wipe out bullying all in one day, then go home and eat your stupid little cakes. You don't have a clue about the real world. You don't know what you're talking about. Laurie Marshall strides away, leaving me alone in the rain. So there's a little, a little kind of slice of Coco in action, and it tells us more about her personality than the mood board does. We know that she's quite brave, actually, and that she's the kind of person who'll stand up for somebody in trouble. And I think we also know that she's quite impulsive because she jumped into that situation without really thinking about the fact that it might have been a little bit dangerous. And what do we know about Laurie Marshall? That maybe he is actually nowhere near as sweet as he looks in the photo. So um, that, that's something to think about. But I guess that when you do just see a little chunk of story, it's not the whole picture. And of course, we were seeing that scene through Coco's eyes, and we know she's impulsive. What if she has actually misjudged that, if she didn't have the whole picture either? and something slightly different could have been going on. So maybe we, we need to just hang on before we judge Laurie and decide whether he's nice or not. So maybe you actually need to read the story to find out what was actually happening there.